So we're moving into chapter four now. Uh, so let me remind you how the history of the universe is essentially a story about the interplay between matter and energy since the beginning of time. Such interactions began in the Big Bang and continue today in everything from the microscopic jiggling of atoms to gargantuan collisions of galaxies. Just like these ones. These are dancing galaxies. They're dancing until they're going to collapse onto one another. We're going to learn about these things. Um, maybe close to the very end of the, of the class, the, the last week, definitely. So, in this chapter, uh, we'll discuss the laws that govern motion and energy, as by understanding these laws, you will be able to make sense of many of the wide-ranging phenomena that surround you on so many scales. So we'll dive even more from now on into the why, the what, sorry, into the why question, not necessarily in the what is out there, right? So we're not doing the, the, the trivia game, okay? But the why is uh, it's very important, right? We'll, uh, we'll get to know about Newton's discoveries, Sir Isaac Newton, and his ability to put together the awesome thoughts and experiments that spurred, were spurred by the Copernican uh, Revolution, by Kepler's calculations, by Galileo's studies that we've been uh, talking about in the previous chapter. So indeed, Newton was the one to put, put all the pieces together into a simple system of laws, three first, and then the rowing that binds them all. If that rings any ring again, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, which happened around um, 1666, right? So quite some time ago. And, uh, and only after uh, Newton invented calculus and many other wonderful things like optics and new ways of building powerful telescopes. But, hey, we won't have time to talk about all of these here. So uh, we're basically building the toolbox that we're going to need to understand much better stars and then later on galaxies and the rest of the universe. So uh, we're going to start by describing motion. Now you probably heard the terms used to describe motion in science, terms like velocity, acceleration, momentum. Uh, however, their scientific definitions may differ slightly from those you use in casual conversation. So let's investigate the precise meanings of these terms. So speed, this is the rate at which objects move, right? Or one object moves. Okay, so basically it's telling you uh, in how much time you can cover a certain distance. So by definition, the speed is the distance uh, that you travel, let's say, divide by the time it took you to travel. So, of course, the units, and I would strongly encourage you to use these units that are used in the international system of units, meters per second. An example would be 10 or 300 kilometers, oh sorry, meters per second. We already talked about the speed of light and it had that kind of units. All right, and then we have the velocity. And there is actually uh, a difference between speed and velocity because the velocity is a speed with a direction, right? It's kind of like you know, this velocity is different. I'm going to call it V1 is different than V2, right? Even though you know, they have the same magnitude, and I illustrate that by the size of the arrow. They have different directions. Let's 
same magnitude or speed right they could be the same speed but if they have different directions then you're gonna end up with different velocities all right uh, another one would be the acceleration the acceleration is defined as uh, being produced or being actually the change any change in velocity and I want you to pay attention to that it is not simply a change in the speed it could be a change in the speed but if there is actually any uh, there is, if there is no change if say no change in speed but there is change in direction the result is an acceleration of course the speed for example can uh, decrease and that would be this situation speed decreases direction doesn't change and you end up with an acceleration which will be negative sometimes that is called deceleration but from the physics point of view or science point of view that is an acceleration which is negative okay another example here right so you speed up There's no change in direction, so you have acceleration, which is going to be positive. How about in this situation? Here, you might have no change, even though the, chain, the speed stays constant, all right? I'm not gonna write anymore, but the direction is changing, you're gonna end up with an acceleration. So I wanted to make sure we went through um, through this distinction between speed, velocity, and what the, the change in either of them, uh, how the change in either of them can produce an acceleration. All right. Now, the one of the most important types of acceleration is the acceleration caused by gravity. Now, this was uh, first kind of discovered by uh, Galileo Galilei, although he might not have been able to explain the concept as well as Newton did it uh, later on. So here's what Galileo Galilei did. So say this is the uh, leaning, but not quite leaning, a tower. He went on a tower of Pisa. And so this would be Galileo Galilei. All right. And he threw a bunch of um, weights, right, different weights from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Pisa and demonstrated actually that gravity accelerates all objects by the same amount. And the important thing he here is, right, so at the same rate, the, the, the speed of those objects changes at the same rate, regardless, so we have same rate of change for velocity regardless of mass. So basically we have a tiny pebble, right? We have tiny pebble or a big potato, right? Big, big, big M, for example, a small M. They always had their speed increased every second okay every each passing second the speed increases by 10 meters per second all right so change in speed every second this would be time Remember, what is the change in speed in time? That is an acceleration. In this case, this is g. 
and on earth it has this value it is 10 meters per second per second right so this is measured in meters per second this is measured in seconds and so the result is 10 meters per second squared all right on mastering astronomy when you're gonna uh, work out problems with the acceleration of gravity this is 9.8 meters per second squared all right sometimes it's good enough to work with the value of 10 sometimes it's not. So that's pretty interesting, right? So all objects on the surface of the Earth gain 10 meters per second in their speed for each second. So meters per second per second, right? Now this could be surprising at first, as you might be well aware that, for example, a feather floats gently to the ground while a rock plummets. However, if you run this same experiment, say, on the surface of the Moon, where there is no air resistance, then both of these things would fall at the same rate. They're not going to gain the same 10 meters per second every second because that gravitational acceleration that is for Earth and for the Moon, that is going to be uh, different. All right, so uh, more tools in the toolbox. Okay, here's what we have here, we're going to talk about the momentum or linear momentum because we have another momentum, an angular angular momentum later on. So linear momentum, that is defined as the mass times the velocity. Momentum is usually P, so it's mass times velocity. All right. Just gonna use a different color here. All right. Okay. And the thing is, any any change in momentum, right? So say you have p final minus p initial. That is obviously by the definition. That is going to be mass times v final minus mass times v initial right you can actually take a common factor the mass and you have v final minus v initial well what is this obviously that is a change in velocity as well as this was a change in momentum okay of course any change happens in time, right? So, in time. But remember what a change in velocity in time is? You probably do. That is acceleration. So let's put this together again. So we started with change in momentum in time equals with the mass times look at all this flow acceleration or mass times acceleration just in general it turns out that the change in momentum in time, the rate at which the momentum changes, that is the force, all right? And you're going to see this again pretty soon. So a net force is needed to change the momentum. And as you probably gathered from these calculations, that generally means an acceleration or a change in velocity. All right, and the other tool in our box is the angular momentum, and that is the product, right? So we have times here, angular momentum, or L, that is M times V times R. So that applies for things that rotate. Something like 
for example the orbit of the earth around the sun remember how the sun is on one of the four sides so what do we have we have a speed here and we have the distance r and the earth has a mass right so the mass of the object the speed and then the kind of arm of the rotation distance to the point around which so this is distance to the point around which rotation happens all right okay so uh, it turns out that gravity is a force, kind of like the types we already talked about. So gravity, force of gravity, this is weight. It is actually, you know, a mass times, can you guess which acceleration? Obviously it's going to be the gravitational acceleration. And so you can see mass is different than weight. Mass is total amount of matter in an object, while the weight is the force that acts upon an object. So here are some uh, cute examples that uh, I want to discuss with you. So say you're in an elevator, maybe you or just a friend of you, yours, all right, and I want you to consider the following situation. So we have here, we have constant velocity, and it could be zero, zero or just a constant velocity, right? That elevator, for the elevator. So what you're going to measure, right? Measure normal weight. However, in this case, your elevator accelerates upward. Well, if you look at a scale in that kind of elevator doing this acceleration upward, you're going to find out that you're weighing more. So basically, right, your mass didn't change, but you see, because of the additional force that acts on the elevator, therefore on you, because it acts, it's going to act on everything that, you know, the elevator is, and that includes you, then your weight is going to feel and look more, be more. How about in this case? So what do we have here? Here we have the elevator accelerates downward. What do you think you're going to measure on a scale? Less weight. Well, what if that acceleration now downward is going to happen? So now we have that downward acceleration is going to be basically the gravitational acceleration, right? So free fall. I don't wish this upon you, right? I hope you're never going to be in that situation, you or any of your friends. Uh, what's going to happen? What do you think you're going to weigh? All this, all this dial is going to go back to zero. So no weight, right? Basically, you are weightless in free fall. At the same time, you're still going to have the same mass in any one of these situations. Isn't that interesting? All right, so more about this weightlessness thing, right? So we just learned that the weightlessness is due to a constant state of free fall, right? So in free fall, you're being pulled towards the Earth or another planet. That's going to happen 
But the same way, if you're on the you know on an elevator on the surface of Mars, for example, or the Moon, is just you know the acceleration is just going to be different. Okay. However, because you and everything you are with are experiencing the same forces, you are not being pushed into anything, and so therefore that's why you have no sense of weight. But that is actually the same force that acts on you while you're sitting on your chair, say now, while you're watching this lecture, okay? But the chair is resist resisting you falling through it, so therefore that gives you the sense of weight. All right, so we're gonna explore this concept, right? So we have, okay, free fall, situation B, uh, A, but then B, C, D, and so on to F. Here's what happens, we're gonna, now instead of dropping something from a, a very tall tower, we're going to give it a little velocity horizontally, right? So it could be, you know, a little larger one for for uh, situation C or D or, right? So you're launching something, they're still going to fall on the earth just at a much, you know, at a certain distance away from the location of the tower. But if the speed, the velocity is going to be strong enough, right, at some point that object is just not going to fall, is going to, right, starting with uh, situation D, E, and F, they're going to come back up where they started, and actually they will continue all that orbiting, right, so D, E, F, right, still free falling, yet never reaching the Earth, right? Yet orbiting the Earth. So, what do you think is missing here? We have gravity in space. This is what we discovered here, right? So being in space, being in orbit, right? That Now, so in case uh, you feel overwhelmed by everything you're learning so far, I just thought I'll leave this with you uh, because uh, you know, that's kind of, that kind of exemplifies the way I usually feel about learning. So I wanted you to know that uh, you're just not the only ones out there 